Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll, coming up. We'll speak to Ukraine's former finance minister about the challenges of managing an economy during a war. And as the world's biggest container shipping company suspend links to Russia, we'll look at how the crisis is impacting global trading routes. Well, the war in Ukraine is coming at a huge cost to the country's population. But the government also needs financial support to fight the Russian invasion and continue funding public services. Kyiv has so far raised hundreds of millions of euros worth of war bonds and it secured billions in emergency aid from the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Let's speak now to Natalie Jurasko, who was the finance minister of Ukraine from 2014 to 2016. Natalie, thank you for being with us. You were in office at a time when Ukraine was fighting a war in the eastern Donbass region. Obviously, today's situation is very different, but could you give us an idea of the sort of financial strain the government is under? Absolutely. When, when I was finance minister in 2014, first of all, it was a terrible shock. Um, in this case, uh, it's slightly different because we've been preparing for it, unfortunately, with knowledge. In 2014, when I was finance minister, the country was on a financial, at a financial abyss. We had no reserves in the central bank to defend the currency. We had no money in the treasury to pay our bills. And we had no military because the former president had basically destroyed it. Today, Ukraine is starting from a much better position, having worked the last eight years, notwithstanding war, to build reserves in the central bank, to defend the currency, and to build a budget and a tax system. But that said, the situation today is so much worse. If in 2014, 20% of GDP was knocked out and 7% of our territory because of the illegal invasion of Crimea and Donbass, today the whole country is under attack. Entire cities are being bombed to the ground. Entire airports, roads, the ports have been blocked. It's an economic strangulation of the country. So the situation is much more dire and much more severe than anything uh, that we lived through over the last eight years of war in the East and with the illegal invasion and occupation, annexation of Crimea. What does a war do to a country's finances? How, if you're in charge of an economy, what do you what do you do to manage it? Well, um, the first thing you do is stop uh, spending money on things that are not of absolute first priority. And first priority in this case will be financing the military, the defense of the country to win this war, and two, to support the people of Ukraine. As you can well imagine, almost no one is working anymore. So what we would call unemployment and other systems, stipends, have to be provided for almost all the population. Access to medicine has to be provided for the population. Access to pension monies, which are paid, have to, has to continue. We're blessed that after cleaning up the banking system in 2015 and 16, the banking system is functioning still in Ukraine, and that's really um, a real big positive. But right now, the government needs to and has worked to get, collect taxes in advance from as many companies as they could, set up two funds where people can donate directly to the budget of Ukraine, one for military support and one for humanitarian support, and they have to focus on those priorities. I would suggest that right now, as we had to do a debt restructuring, a sovereign debt restructuring back then in 2015, the government should be looking at whether or not they can call a moratorium and cease making payments. I'm not suggesting a default. I'm suggesting a negotiated solution with creditors who must understand that this is an extraordinary situation that is unheard of. At the same time, we've had Ukraine already raise what are called war bonds, essentially kind of emer emergency funding, rates of 11%. Is that a sustainable way to raise money for the government? No, I don't think it is. And um, I think, you know, the ability to issue new debt going forward during the war is going to be extraordinarily constrained. I think the war bonds you're talking about were domestic, and that was pulling money from domestic investors who were willing to do that at the time. I think they are considering trying to do a war bond a la Israel, where the diaspora globally is able to purchase the bonds, which is a nice way. But frankly, that is all going to take time. Um, and that's why the focus right now is on either international support, meaning IMF, World Bank, EBRD, uh, US government, G7, G20 support, as we did again back in six, in 15 when we built a $40 billion 
um, balance of payments cushion with the support of our bilateral international partners. The same has to be done right now for balance of payments support urgently uh, today. And I'm only speaking about urgent necessity to maintain sustainability and viability. I'm not talking about rebuilding, which is a whole nother world. What do you make of the appeals that have made for Bitcoin and, and NFT donations? Is that something that's an avenue worth pursuing, do you think? They are pursuing it. They've collected, I think, about $10 million in Bitcoin already. I think that anything and everything, every tool that's out there needs to be used right now to support Ukraine. And, and I say that asking businesses to self-sanction, to voluntarily apply their ESG principles and walk the walk of leaving, ceasing, doing any business in Russia. Every part of any business that we do with Russia right now is indirectly financing the war. It's paying for the bombs that are raining over the heads of the children, the civilians trying to escape, to flee. So we shouldn't be financing this war. I think yesterday's move on the part of the United States to ban oil imports, as painful as that is for every American at the gas pump, is very, very important. And frankly speaking, is gonna be less costly than if this war continues and or spreads beyond Ukraine. Okay, Natalie Jurasko, uh, Ukraine's former finance minister, thank you very much for speaking to us. Now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is also causing chaos for the global shipping industry. Three of the sector's biggest players have suspended cargo bookings to and from Russia. Rail and air transport has also been hit by sanctions and the fighting. Let's speak now to Michelle Visa Bachmann, who is a shipping and energy market expert at Lloyd's List. Michelle, thank you very much for being with us. Can you please put this in context for us? How significant is this disruption to global trade from the sanctions and from the fighting? Well, this is the most significant recalibration in oil and gas and coal trades that I've seen since the first Gulf War in the early 1990s. You have amazingly amazing volatility, huge price rises in oil and L LNG and, and other energy sectors. You also have major and significant disruptions to grains trades, which has lifted wheat prices to record high. All of this stokes global con in inflationary fears. And of course, there are also problems with the um, the supply of, of gas to Europe in, in the future as well. What about the shipping routes that have been changed by this? We know that, you know, we've got some of the biggest players in cargo shipping saying they can't or they, they won't use, um, they won't take bookings for, for cargo shipments to Russia. What does that mean in terms of goods coming in and out of the country? Well, for container trades, that's where you're seeing um, a lot of the container lines are now not calling there. That represents about 3% of that particular element of global trade. So the effect is, is rather limited. Where you're seeing the huge effects really are with um, the flows of oil, gas, wheat and and those other commodities that are that are shipped in bulk um, with wheat and other grains this is the corn season now and so those those the, those um, exports have now been disrupted you've ne you're seeing um, bulk carriers that have been abandoned in some of the Ukraine ports because of the the fighting there and then you're seeing also a lot of reputational risk uh, seen for, for being a buyer of Russian cargoes. So export flows from Russia have, have dramatically reduced. So let's say oil exports from Russia are about 7 million barrels per day. We're already seeing a contraction of 1.5 million barrels per day. Now, the global supply of oil is already um, having problems rebalancing post-COVID. And so this means that these alternative sources uh, are very difficult to find. Um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are perhaps one source, and they've signaled that they're not willing to, to increase production. What happens to the, the Russian tankers already at sea that, that are, have oil and have nowhere to dock? Will they essentially have to return home? Well, we're already seeing some of the diesel cargoes, which are loaded from the Baltic Russian ports, are uh, flowing uninterrupted, but in smaller numbers to France, Germany. There is a ban on Russian controlled and affiliated tankers into the UK, which has seen some turnaround. When we come to liquefied natural gas, um, the flow from the Yamal Arctic project into Europe is 
at this moment in time still continuing. So it depends on, it's rather arbitrary and it does depend on what actions different governments are taking. Um, in the UK, they've made a stand and they've they've been able to do that. But once again, their reliance isn't as great as, say, France or Germany is on, on especially diesel and LNG. Um, Europe imports, the EU27 imports 42% of their diesel from outside those member groups from Russia because refineries don't make enough to meet demand. So how they're going to find an alternative source hasn't yet been determined, which is why we're seeing those shipments so far on the water, finding, being able to birth and discharge in European countries. Even before this particular crisis, the global shipping industry had been facing huge challenges in the pandemic, things like crew shortages. How will this war affect that situation? Is it going to make it even worse? Well, one of the things to remember is that Russian and Ukraine seafarers are a dominant part of the 1.5 million seafaring population, accounting for about 16%. So at the moment, some ship owners with Russian crew have found that they're finding it very difficult to pay them because of the financial and banking sanctions. So that's just one small way that the sanctions have affected the shipping sector. And of course, also um, Ukraine, Ukrainian crew um, want to go home and also the difficulties in replacing them as well. So it's not just the um, commodities, global commodities and logistics and supply chains. There's also very much a human element here. OK, Michelle Visa Bachmann from Lloyd's List. Thank you very much for speaking to us. That's all from us for now, but you'll find this and all of our previous programmes available to watch on our website and as a podcast wherever you usually listen. And we're on social media for your comments and questions. Until next time, thanks for watching.